Well, hello there. I'm here at Imperative Care with Dr. Shahid Nimji of Ohio State University. Thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me, Justin. A pleasure to be here. So we're going to talk a little bit about intracranial hypertension. Can you tell us about your practice? My practice in idiopathic intracranial hypertension has largely uh, evolved from the papers that have been published, a lot of them notably in JNIS, where we identify the patient population that has stenosis, that has a gradient across that stenosis. And once we've identified that gradient, which I typically follow a gradient of eight millimeters of mercury or more, we then uh, identify those patients and I place a stent across them. In my practice, I largely use a silver stent. Okay. That's fantastic. And so I, I know that we're gonna talk about the track star. But I was wondering if you could show us on your slides, you know, before you were using that, what was your setup? So I got to be honest with you, when I started doing idiopathic intracranial hypertension, it was motivated by a senior colleague of mine who took care of idiopathic intracranial hypertension with a VP shunt and another VP shunt and a lumbar shunt and a VP shunt and on and on. And we were looking for a durable way to get around this, which was which was the stenting as we, you and I both work with. And these were one of my least favorite lesions because if you can see in the figure here, I had an 088 catheter that I would park at the most distal aspect of the internal jugular vein. And this is a generous picture where you can find a, a, a mid-range catheter that you can use to get across the transverse sinus. I never had that mid-range catheter. So for me, it was a 088 in the jugular vein. And then it was getting an 0818 platinum plus wire over a silver stent system, and literally with all, you know, I was I had a full head of hair before I started doing this, and then having to go through with a platinum plus wire and then drop the stent was it was really cumbersome for me. Yeah. So so you know as we go through this, this has gone from my least favorite procedure to my most favorite procedure. Fantastic. So I know we want to talk about track stars. So how did how was that a game changer for you? How do you, and how do you use it in this setup? So what the track star has done for me is it allowed me, and it was something that I learned from transarterial uh, usage of the track star into the venous side, and what it's allowed me to do is take full advantages of all the attributes of a track star. The proximal end of the track star providing me with that uh, stabilization and that stiffness that I need to get the catheter up, and really on the, uh, or pardon me, that's on the proximal side of the catheter, closest to the leg or, or the arm where you're using it, and the distal part that's going intracranial, that has the flexibility and it has that 088 opening that allows me distal access and a platform with which to push something as large as a silver system in order to deploy this. And you know, this started with me using it in flow diversion, I use it for stent assisted coiling or balloon assisted coiling where you need that extra, that extra opening to get everything through and still take an angiogram. So that's how my evolution's gone. Great, and I know that here at the annual meeting you have some new data. Uh, can you share that with us right now? Yeah, sure. So uh, the, when I look at it, how I use it today, and this is sort of emblematic in how we collected this data, the first thing I do is I take the 088 track star, and over an 035 glide wire, I get the track star exactly to the point where I want to deliver the stent. So if we look at this as a classical case of idiopathic intracranial hypertension, we have a 31-year-old female. You can see the focal stenosis in the Ohio State University red that I'm showing you right there. And <laughs> it has an 11 millimeter gradient, right? Yeah. And so this was my, this is the, all the other things that you need for me. But when I do it now, and I'm going to use this case as emblematic of how we collected our data, we start with just an 035 wire. You can see, and I've broken it up into two sections. And I simply have that purchase that I need on an 035. And I'm just, you're going to see how I just kind of milk it up over the 035. Before, in my old practice, this was a massive win, right? Just that first part. Absolutely. But you can see where we had that stenosis. I mm -hmm. now have the 088 catheter exactly, in fact, a little beyond where I want to deploy my stent. Wow, and you didn't, you didn't put the wire up too far. You didn't, didn't even have to put it up in the it, superstitial sinus there. Uh, Trackstar is an appropriate name for this catheter. Wow, that's, that's fantastic. So then as we transition, we have the catheter exactly where we want to, and I'm talking about the Trackstar, and literally all we have to do is it's forward energy with the Zilver stent system, and you can see right here, and it's interesting, I have an, a platinum plus through this system 
uh, to provide that stabilization. But even more recently, I've done a three-vessel a three-stent construct in this situation, where the trackster provides you with enough support. You don't even need to drop your stent over a wire. You just literally have all the stabilization. And you can see how I let the stent evolve in its opening, and then the trackster comes back as we need it to in that fashion. And then finally, uh, nothing tells the truth like post-operative imaging. And you can see that the focal stenosis at the transverse sigmoid junction has resolved. And we have a great result of note. As soon as we drop this, the, resolution, uh, the gradient has resolved. And you know, we wean that patient off their diamox. And the patient's been uh, symptom-free with respect to papilledema for the, going on six months. So with respect to the data, um, we, did a, we have a multi-center experience with venous sinus stenting using the TrackStar. It's from three different institutions. Uh, we had a series of 58 patients that used TrackStar LDP for venous sinus stenting. In every scenario, you can see the demographics, but I think the take-home point for this is that we were able to track the TrackStar where we wanted to go to drop our stent without using any extra intermediate catheter, simply using the technique that I outlined in the video earlier, and we were able to successfully drop all of the stents that we wanted to and the location that we wanted to. And the final thing that I would show you is you can see the preponderance of patients in the transverse sinus at the torcula and some patients that even had uh, oddly enough, the stenosis in the superior sagittal sinus, we were even able to track up to the level of the superior sagittal sinus in order to provide the safety and the simplicity we needed in order to deploy the stent. That's fantastic. So, you know, as someone is starting to kind of use this technique, are there any specific kind of extra tips? I know you mentioned several so far, but what are some of the key tips that you would recommend for someone starting to use this? Yeah, I think the easiest thing to recognize is, you know, I de develop my experience with TrackStar on the arterial side. And so, you know, if you have no familiarity with it in the, in the first place and you don't want to start with venous sinus uh, stenting, you could start on the arterial side to get familiar with it. But I would tell you that the internal jugular vein, as you well know, is a big vessel. It provides you ample space, opportunity, and safety to feel what it's like to, to advance an 035 wire. And as, and as you astutely pointed out, you don't need to get that wire very far in order to track the 088 mm -hmm. over it. So yeah, you start with sure. that, and I think you'll find you'll be very happy with the result. Fantastic. I have one last question for you on this. And something we wrestled with a few years back when we started doing this work is, how do you get started? How do you start your IH practice? Yeah, that's a great point. So as I alluded to in the beginning of the talk, it really helps to have a neurosurgical colleague who really practices taking care of this patient population. For better or for worse, at The Ohio State University Medical Center, we have a huge idiopathic intracranial hypertension population that really are indeed a better solutions than a repeat ventricular peritoneal or lumbar peritoneal shunting. And, and, and that, that neurosurgeon has been only too happy to, uh, no pun intended, shunt that practice to me. <laughs> Understood. We face the same issue as well. And no, this is fantastic work. And I just want to say thank you so much for being here. And thank you to Imperative Care. Thank you for the opportunity.